Hello everyone and welcome back to my Warhammer 40k guides. I am Brady and today I will be giving you the top 10 armies of Orktober, I mean October. First off, I want to apologize for being late as it's my civic duty as a Canadian to do so. But I've been extremely busy over the past week trying to catch up on my videos and because I wanted to get the Orc review out as soon as possible since that codex was just released. But now the wait is over and it's time to get into the top 10 armies of October. For those of you who are new around here, this top 10 is based off of almost all of the ITC, GTs, and Majors that took place during the month of October. There were a few events that didn't post their final placings, and also a few events that didn't go through the Best Coast Pairings app, which is where I get my information for the video. So those events won't be included in this list. For the events that did make their final placings available, the armies that place top 3 more often have a higher spot on the list, with tiebreakers being the actual placings whether they were 1st, 2nd, or 3rd more often. And if I needed another tiebreaker, it came down to their placings on my previous top 10 list. And before we get into the main topic of this video, this video was sponsored by TheMagnetBaron.com. They offer magnets of all sizes, magnetized movement trays, and even magnetized flight stands, all for a great price. I personally use their magnets and they work well for magnetizing models to make transportation easier or even just to change the loadouts on your units. So if you're looking at picking up some magnets for your hobbying needs, then check out TheMagnetBaron.com. A link will be in the description. So with that out of the way, let's get into what you guys came here for, and that is the Top 10 Armies of October. Number 10. Orcs. It wouldn't be Orktober without Orcs in the list, and I'm glad in October at least one Orc army made it to a top 3 of an event. A thing that should be noted though is that the event this army placed second at, there was house rules that you couldn't use any allies, so you could only bring one sub-faction as your entire army, which I think is a big contributing factor as to why this list was able to do so well. This was also before Orcs had their codex, and now that they do have their codex, I think this list will be even stronger especially if you use multiple clans to get the most out of all of your units. Let's take a look at the list though. This is a 1500 point list as well, so keep that in mind. This player opted to play a variation of the Green Tide, using two units of 30 boys, some Gretchen, 30 Storm boys, some knobs, and a ton of support for the infantry. The war boss allows orcs within 6 inches of him to charge even if they advance, and the war boss is on a bike which makes it easier for him to make this possible. They brought a big mech on bike to give the 5 plus invol to all the infantry, and again he's on the bike like the war boss to make sure that he can move appropriately to keep all the boys inside of his bubble. A weird boy for some psychic support, some Gretchen for some area denial and sitting on objectives, and a pain boy on war bike to again support the big squads of boys by giving them a feel no pain. And he is also on a bike to ensure that he gets the movement he needs to be able to give his aura to all the units he needs to. This is pretty much the type of list that I would make even after the release of the codex. Although a lot of these models are index only units now, as there is no war boss on bike anymore and same with the other supporting characters. Most ITZ events allow index entries though, so in that regard you should be good. But if you're planning on playing in an event that doesn't allow index entries, then you'd have to change all of those support characters to the ones from the codex, which aren't on bikes which will make maneuvering your army a little bit more difficult if you want everything to get into your support auras. Overall though, I'm glad orcs made it onto the list for October, and with the release of their codex, I'm assuming we're going to see a lot more of them since they have some really good tricks in their pocket. Number 9. Chaos Demons Chaos Demons are back on the list, this time in the ninth spot. There was one list that placed second at a GT during October, and it consisted of Nurgle and Corn Demons, and some Thousand Suns allies. This list consisted of a battalion of Nurgle Demons with two units of 30 Plague Bearers, a Pox Bringer, and Spoil Pox Scrivener for support and also a unit of Nurglings for area denial and sitting on objectives. The Poxbringer is great because he gives plus one strength to the Plague Bearers to make them strength five, which is great against pretty much all of the infantry in the game. And the Scrivener adds two to the movement characteristics of the Plague Bearers within six inches, meaning your Plague Bearers now move seven inches, which is basically Eldari infantry movement, which is the fastest in the game. Then we have a patrol of Corn Demons, which has a Demon Prince with an axe and a Bloodletter Bomb. And the last attachment is a Supreme Command Detachment of Thousand Suns, which consists of Aramon on a disc, three Demons of Zinch, and Magnus himself. To get into how the list is played out, the Plague Bearers provide a screen for all of the characters and protect them through the character rule. The extra movement on the Plague Bearers works well in this list because it allows the screen to move faster so you can get your Thousand Suns characters into smite range quicker and also to inevitably deliver them into glorious melee combat when the time comes. And the Plague Bearers are also one of the best screening units in the game because they have a 5 plus invol and a 5 plus feel no pain. They can also be buffed to be minus 1 to hit and also get plus 1 to their saving throws which would give them a 4 up invol. This combined with the 7 inch movement makes them the best screen for this type of list. 
the Bloodletter Bomb deep strikes and comes in with a 3d6 charge because of the upgraded Banner of Blood. This allows them to come in behind the enemy if the enemy doesn't have great area denial, and also forces the enemy to try to space out their army to try to mitigate the damage the Bloodletters do, which could force your opponent's hand and they can't really castle up and give everything certain auras like you would want to with like that orc list I explained earlier. Magnus does Magnus things and can be used as another character for more spells, or against certain armies can just run in and smack stuff to death. Overall though, I think this is a great list and is actually very close to the type of chaos list that I am currently running, and I'm happy to see chaos in the top 10. Number 8, Tyranids. The Zerg, I mean Tyranids, are back in the top 10, this time taking up the 8th spot with a 2nd place finish in the month of October. This list is a mix of a bunch of stuff. First we have a battalion of Kraken, which consists of a Hive Tyrant, a Swarm Lord, some Gene Stealers, two units of Gaunts, six Hive Guard with Impaler Cannons, and some Tyrant Guard. Then we have a Supreme Command of Gene Stealer Cult with two Magus and a Primus, and 15 Pure Strain Gene Stealers. And then a battalion of Kronos Tyranids with two Neurothropes and some Ripper Swarms. As for the strategy of this list, the Gene Stealers and Gaunts all do their thing and run in and swarm the enemy. The Swarm Lord can even slingshot one of these units in to get a turn one charge off if the situation is right. The Tyrant Guard hang out with the Hive Tyrant to support it if needed, or they add to the Swarm. The Hive Guard blast stuff away from afar, the Ripper Swarm sit on objectives to deny area, and all the characters follow up after the Horde to cast some spells and possibly go smack stuff as well when the time is right. Overall, I think this is a pretty decent list. It has some decent melee, some decent shooting, and some decent psychic, so I think it's a well-rounded list. Number 7. Tau. The fish people are back on the top 10 this month, with one first place finish in the month of October. The list this time around is a brigade of the Tau Sept. It includes only one commander, since you can only have one commander per detachment, an Ethereal and a Kadra Fireblade, six units of five Fire Warriors, two Fire Sight Marksmen, Triptides or three Riptides, two Pathfinder teams, three units of Shield Drones, and three units of Sniper Drones. So basically what this list boils down to is some infantry, triptides, and a ton of riptide support with all the drones. The infantry kind of do its own thing but still provide a screen if needed, and added firepower and overwatch through the rule for the greater good. They can also break off from the death ball to go grab objectives if needed. And the riptides get a ton of support from the drones through the savior protocol rule where drones can take shots for the riptides. And with how many shield drones and sniper drones they have, it's actually very hard to get to the riptides. And when and if you do, those riptides can have a 4 plus invul with one of their abilities, which makes it decently survivable. More often than not though, I think this player opted to go with more shots instead of the invul, since there were enough drones to protect the riptides anyways. The Firesight Marksmen are great too as they are a pretty easy way to get marker lights on something, and then use the strategy to get D3 more marker lights on that unit. So between the two marksmen, you can get 4 marker lights on average with that strategy. Then you have 2 more units of Pathfinders to get that 5th marker light for the plus 1 to hit against the target. The Marksman also gives plus 1 to hit for the Sniper Drones, and when combined with a Drone Controller from the Commander, your Sniper Drones actually hit on 3s, and then possibly hit on 2s if they're shooting at a target with 5 Marker Lights on them. They can also target characters if needed because they are Snipers, but to be honest, I would just use them to shoot regular infantry, since it seems that they are better suited for that. And then on top of that, Sniper Drones also act as protection for the Riptides, who are the main firepower in the list. This is basically a Triptide list with a ton of support for them to allow them to put in some serious work. But even though the Triptides are the big threat in this list, the rest of the army has potential to do damage as well. Overall, I think this is an amazing Tau list, and I would personally love to play this list myself. Number 6. Harlequins. The Space Clowns are back in the list again, and yet again it's because of their jet bikes with the Haywire Blasters. This list uses an Outrider of Harlequins with 3 units of jet bikes with a Shadow Seer as the HQ, followed by Eldar's version of the Loyal 32 with a battalion of a Latok that includes a Farseer Skyrunner, a Warlock Skyrunner, and 3 units of 5 Rangers, and then a Prophets of Flesh battalion for some board control and beefy units like the Grotesques. The way to play this list is to have your Rangers sit on backfield objectives or to give chip damage throughout the game. The Warlock and Farseer support with Jinx and Doom. The jet bikes murder some infantry or even vehicles with their haywire blasters, depending on what your target priority is at the time. And the wrecks sit on objectives further up the board, while also denying and creating board control or screening for the grotesques. And the grotesques are pretty beefy distraction carnifexes that can also put in some hurt if they get into close combat. Overall, I think this is a pretty strong list, but wish that some of the other Harlequin units saw a bit more play since they are amazing models to see on the board. Number 5. Inari. 
That's right, Inuri has dropped down to the 5th place this time around. There was only one list that topped an event and it received the 1st place finish. Inuri is a very unique army in the regard that it takes a very skilled player to actually do well with them. If you took this Inari list and gave it to a new player, I highly doubt it would place well at an event. But in the hands of a top player, they are pretty much unstoppable with all of the things they can do because of all the options that the Soul Burst mechanic gives them. As for the list that plays first, it's pretty much a generic Inari variant. The first attachment is an Alaytok attachment with a couple of Farseers, a Warlock Conclave, three units of five Rangers, a Hemlock, and a Wave Serpent. The second attachment is a Nari and features a Vrain, a Spirit Seer, two units of nine Shining Spears, a unit of Swooping Hawks, and a unit of nine Dark Reapers. As for the strategy for this list, the basics of it is you hide your Dark Reapers in the Wave Serpent alongside the Warlock Conclave. You also hide your bikes behind or in a ruin of some sort. Then your Rangers either screen or sit on backfield objectives, while your Hemlock sits in the back preferably out of range of everything, because it has such a good move that no matter what on turn one you can move it to where you need it anyways. And the characters are protected by the character rule by being behind a unit the enemy can't see. This type of deployment is easy for an Ari and basically always means if the opponent goes first, they aren't going to get much done in terms of killing the Inari. So on the Inari's first turn, they send a unit of spears in and quicken them to get them within 7 inches of an infantry unit that they can kill. You hop your Dark Reapers out of the Wave Serpent, and then you have the option of making either your spears or your Reapers shoot in the Psychic Phase with the spell Word of the Phoenix, depending on the matchup and the situation and your target priority. And then in the Shooting Phase, you can have your spears shoot and kill a unit, and then decide if you want to move back and hide again, or shoot again. More often than not though, you should pick move back and hide again so you can repeat this process on your next turn. Or you can let them sit there and hold on to their soul burst, charge a unit in the charge phase, kill it in the fight phase, and then soul burst back to safety. This is what makes Inari tricky to play because you want to get the most bang for your buck out of them, but you also want them to end their turn as far away from the enemy and hidden so they can't be shot at. The hemlock does hemlock things and the characters support the units of spears and reapers given the situation. There are a lot of variables that go into calculating these plays though, which makes Inari more difficult to pilot than most armies. When done right though, they are insanely strong. Number 4. Custodes. That's right, Custodes are back in the top 10 this month, and they come back at 4th place with one second place finish and one third place finish, and both took place at the same event. The second place list I can't really discuss because the player opted to not upload it to the Best Coast Pairings app, but the third place list is somewhat unique from what we normally see. This list features a Custodes Battalion with three units of Custodian Guard, two Shield Captains with Salvo Launchers, the Vertilis Praetor which gives minus one to hit, and two units of Custody Bikes. They also have the Loyal 32 with an extra Death Core Field Marshal and an Auxiliary Detachment with one Calexis. So this list is pretty straightforward. The guard are there for screening or sitting on backfield objectives, while also getting them 5 command points, while all the custodies move up the board to shoot and smack stuff while also being minus 1 to shoot because of the banner. And what's the biggest counter to custodies being as elite as they are? Well it's probably psychic spells, since smite and other mortal wounds actually hurt custodies a lot. Sure they get a feel no pain against it, but it's not that great. So this player included a Calexus assassin to shut down psychic and help protect his big guys from smites and other spells, which personally I think is a great addition to this army. So you keep the Calexus out front to absorb all the spells, which helps your big guys get closer to the enemy while remaining relatively unharmed. Overall I think this is a great list for custodies, since it's not just bike spam showing that you can still do well even with normal custodies in your list. Now before we get into the top 3, here are a couple of honorable mentions. These armies either lost out on being top 10 because of tiebreakers, or they showed up as 4th or 5th placements at the tournaments in October. So we have Thousand Suns, Ultramarines, Heretic Astartes, Blood Angels, Grey Knights, and Death Guard. And the number beside each army is the placing that they received at the event that they played at. And yes, Grey Knights got a 4th place finish, but it should be noted that this was at the same event that the Orcs placed 2nd at, which meant that there were no allies allowed and only one faction per army, which I think is a big factor in why the Grey Knights did so well at that event. As for the Blood Angels, since I assume some of you will be curious about them, it was your basic Imperial army with some guard, custody bike captains, but it had a battalion of Blood Angels that included a 10 man unit of Death Company, which makes me very happy to see since I love the Death Company and Blood Angels. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the top 3 armies of October. Number 3, Imperial Knights. The Imperial Knights are back on the list in the 3rd spot, with 3 3rd place finishes. 
Like I've said before, Imperial Knights are sort of an anti-meta army, since it requires people to bring way more anti-tank than they rightfully should, which leaves them vulnerable to horde armies or infantry based lists, which takes up the majority of the meta. Even some of the lists I've previously mentioned don't really have good ways of dealing with knight lists through damage. But the thing with knight lists is, is their low model count. So you can sometimes win the game against them just by outboard controlling them and by being on more objectives than them. You can technically win a game of 40k without killing a single model. In fact, that's pretty much what the old Poxwalker and Horror list did before it was nerfed. It just took up the board and stopped the enemy from moving. I'm not saying that your chances are good if you don't kill any models, but I'm just saying that technically it is possible to win that way. So if you have a list that can't kill knights too easily, at least make a list that can outboard control them pretty easily, and you can always try to win that way. As for the knights list though, they have a few variations. The first list is a crusader and two gallants, followed by a bunch of Lehman Rush conqueror tanks, which is actually pretty unique. It's a full on elite list. It also only has five drops, so more often than not it's going to get the plus one to go first. The second list is closer to being the more popular knight list, which is the Loyal 32 with Mortars, a Castellan, a Lancer, and two Gallants. And the final list is the Loyal 32, three Custodes Shield Captains, a Castellan, and two Gallants. Keep in mind though, I don't know if the events these lists played at were using the new FAQ rules, because some events in October decided to not use them since people had already signed up and made their list before the FAQ, which is understandable. So before some of you guys start complaining that the FAQ did nothing, let's give it another month or so and see if the changes combined with the upcoming chapter approved changes affects them anymore. Personally, I think knights are fine, but I also play armies that are great at killing knights, and I understand that most armies in the game can't really compete with them. But most armies aren't viable for high level competitive as of right now anyways, so I think that's more a problem for the rules of those armies and less of a problem that was created by knights. Hopefully chapter approved shows some love to some of those armies that need it. Number 2. Astra Militarum The Imperial Guard sits at the number 2 spot this month with 3 first place finishes. The first list is from the same tournament that didn't allow allies like the Orcs and Grey Knight lists I mentioned previously. This list is pretty unique from what we normally see in competitive and it includes a ton of Lehman Rust tanks. It also has Pask, a ton of infantry, and some Bulgrins, which is actually pretty unique because this is a Cadian list and not Katachan. And personally, this is the first time I've ever seen Cadian Bulgrins in the top list. Other than that though, it's pretty self-explanatory how the list works. The tanks sit still and preferably shoot stuff, while the infantry screen or grab objectives, and the Bulgrins are either used as a deterrent from charges, or they go up the board to cause havoc. It really depends on the matchup and the situation. The second list is the Castlin, Smash Captain, and Katachan list that dominated the Nova Open. So again, I don't know if this tournament where this list was played at was using the new FAQ or not, because again, I know some tournaments didn't enforce it because of the timing of the FAQ and their event. And the final list is a list I talked about in a recent video showing off how tactics can win games over brute strength, and that is the Katachan Brigade with the Castle and Ally. This list was played at an event where they did use the new FAQ, and this is probably why the player opted to drop the Smash Captains, as it was pretty much impossible to fund the Castellan and the Smash Captains with command points because of the FAQ changes. So this player opted to bank a lot on the Castellan and support him with the Katachan Brigade. But although the Castellan is the main damage dealer of the army, the rest of the army is actually very strong and can hold its own, which is shown in my game review video. Overall, I'm happy Guard are still standing firm and consistently placing in top events, but I have a feeling that come chapter approved, we are going to see some points increases to things like Guardsmen, which will definitely change up the meta a bit. Number 1. Drukari The Dark Eldar are number 1 this month, with 1 first place and 2 second place finishes, and 1 third place finish. Technically, Guard did better by having 3 first place finishes, but because of the way I formed these lists, Drukari came out on top because they had more top 3 finishes overall. Drakari are one of the best armies in the game, being very mobile, surprisingly resilient, and very hard hitting, and it's the main reason I chose them to be my main competitive army for the last 4 or 5 months. Even after the changes to Vect, I think Drakari is still a very strong army, and are around the same strength as Zanari, Imperial Guard, and Craftworld Eldar. With that said, there have been a few counter lists popping up here and there, which slowed down Drakari's reign for a bit. But with an ever-changing meta, I assume people thought Drakari was falling out and stopped preparing for them as much and started preparing for knights instead. And if you built your list to kill knights, then Drakari kind of gets a free pass because the things that are good at killing knights aren't necessarily good at killing Drakari. 
This is how the meta fluctuates back and forth. When people gear up to kill one army, then it falters a bit, which is probably why knights aren't first place instead, because I assume people are more scared of knights right now than they are Drakari, so I assume most lists that right now are built with that in mind, because people are aware they're going to go up against one or two knight lists if they go to an event. Also, it's virtually impossible to build a list that's good at killing everything. So again, when your list is dedicated to killing knights, other armies might get under your radar and you might not be able to deal with them as well. With that said though, I do believe that all the top tier armies need some adjustments in chapter approved to bring them more in line with the rest of the armies in the game. So we will most likely see some changes for Drakari in the next chapter approved. With all of that said though, let's briefly talk about the list since this video is starting to drag on. The first list is a Battalion of Prophets of Flesh for some more board control and objective holding with the Talos doing some damage. This is followed up by a Battalion of Blackheart with some Archons, Cabalites, Venoms, Raiders, Ravagers, Mandrakes, and Razorwing Jetfighters. The second list is mainly a Prophets of Flesh force with a Battalion with some Racks and a bunch of Grotesques, and then has an Airwing Detachment of a bunch of Alatoc Flyers for the very strong minus 2 to hit. And then an Auxiliary Support Choice for a Farseer Skyrunner so they can get access to the spell Doom. The third list is a Brigade of Blackheart, with a bunch of Cabalites. Some Archons, some Mandrakes, some Scourges, some Ravagers, some Raiders, some Venoms, and an Auxiliary Support of a Farseer Skyrunner to access the spell Doom. And then the fourth list is a Battalion of Prophets of Flesh, with Rax and Talos, a Spearhead of Blackheart with three Ravagers, and an Archon. And then an Alatoc Battalion with a Farseer, Warlock, two units of Rangers, and a unit of Dire Avengers. Overall, I'm personally happy to see Drakari is back on top, but I do look forward to the changes from Chapter Approved to see what Games Workshop does with them, since I will admit they need some tweaking alongside the other top tier armies. I think they will still be good after Chapter Approved, but we will have to wait and see. Anyways, that's going to be it for this video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more Warhammer 40k content. And if you want to help support the channel even further, you can do so on Patreon. Patreon allows me to make these videos full time, and without my patrons, the channel wouldn't be where it's at today. So thanks again to all of my patrons, I love you all. With that said, a pledge on Patreon gets you basic coaching from myself, and also exclusive access to the Almost Pro Gaming Discord channel, where you can chat with myself and other patrons. We are always talking about the game and helping each other out, so it's great for new players and veterans alike to speak with like-minded players who love the game just as much as you do. I also offer advanced coaching through Patreon, where I can spend an hour or two with you in voice chat and help you build the tournament list for your meta. But I can also explain how to pilot that list in different situations that may arise from certain matchups and things like that. It's basically a personalized faction focus. So if either of those options sound good to you, or if you just want to help support the channel even further, then check me out on Patreon. A link will be in the description. Anyways, thanks for watching the video. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments, and I will see you in the next video. Happy Wargaming.